chapter one this morning, we're going to be looking at the Magnificat, Mary's Song of Praise, Luke 1, verses 46 through 55. Follow along in your Bibles, or we'll put it up here on the screen. Here's what it says. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this great reversal that we just read about. Thank you that the way we look at the world now, the things we see in the world now, are not how it will always be. Thank you that you exalt the humble and cast down the proud. And we pray, Father, that by your mercy, you would help us to be humble. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. And last week, Bob kicked off the Advent season here at Little Church by giving uh, an overview of what we celebrate at Christmas, God's redemptive plan. I had the opportunity of watching the video of it, and, and I know that, that you benefited from his teaching there. What we're going to be doing with the remaining three Sundays of Advent this year is looking at the three songs in Luke's Gospel that relate to the birth of Jesus. So today, we're looking at the Song of Mary here in Luke 1. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the song that Zechariah sings in response to the birth of John the Baptist a little bit later in uh, chapter 1. Uh, and then on the 19th, we're going to look at Simeon's song that he sings in, in Luke uh, chapter 2 uh, when he sees the infant Jesus in the temple. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to look at the traditional Christmas story from Luke 2 and, and talk about the, the song of the shepherds. And I know, you don't really know that they sang, right? It says they said, glory to God in the highest. But it only says Mary said this here too, and we still call this a song. So I'm going to call it a song of the angels uh, in Luke 2 on Christmas Eve. So we're talking about these songs in Luke's gospel throughout the rest of our Advent series. Today, we're looking at the song of Mary, and we're seeing her focus on humility. The title of the sermon today is Salvation for the Humble, because I think humility does form the central part of Mary's song. You see it in a couple of places. You see it, you see it there in verse 48 of Mary's song. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Right? She talks about the same thing in verses 52 and 53. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Sometimes theologians call this somewhat minor theme in scripture, the great reversal, that God exalts the humble and he casts down the proud. The powerful, the people who seem to be powerful at any time and place in history, those are the people that God does away with and exalts others. He changes fortunes. But he doesn't just do that willy-nilly. He does that in the service of his kingdom. God's kingdom is a kingdom that looks very different than the kingdoms of this world. And the result is the hungry are filled, and the rich are sent away and empty. Salvation for the humble. But what is humility? We have to answer that question before we can even talk about what salvation for the humble means. What do we mean when we talk about humility? I do think that humility is one of those words that we often uh, misunderstand. It's an idea that we, that we get wrong, and certainly we don't always understand what the Bible means when it calls people humble or it talks about God exalting the humble. Sometimes when we talk about humble or humility, what we think of is people who are hard on themselves, people who look down on themselves or have a low view of themselves. Whenever I think about that, I remember a man that I 
that I encountered when I was younger, when I was doing my master's work in Charlotte, and, and uh, I was working part-time as a security guard at a local Christian school, a school that Laura taught at, incidentally. Uh, I was a security guard part-time, which means I sat for five hours at the front desk of this facility, signing people in and out of the building, and I uh, was able to do my, my studies in the meantime. It was a good situation. But there was a guy who came, because the, the building was also a, a church building, and there was a man who came to meet with the pastors. Probably once a month he would show up. And I don't know, I, I assume he had some kind of a mental uh, disability, some kind of mental challenge. I'm not quite sure what, what it was he was dealing with. I don't know if he was on medication of some kind or not. I think he was. Or if it wasn't then, I hope he got some help and got some medication. But he would come in, usually in tears. And if he wasn't in tears when he came through the door, he would start crying in the course of our conversation. And he always said the same thing. His name was Robert. And Robert always said the same thing. He said, I'm so dumb, I'm so miserable, I'm so stupid. Same thing, all the time. Sometimes when we talk about humility, that's the type of image that we have in our mind. Somebody who just has a very low view of himself. But well, we know that's not really what humility is, is it? In fact, as we go through the course of this study of Mary's song, what we're going to see is that true humility is a proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and goodness of God. That's what I'd like to impress upon you this morning as we look at Mary's song here. True humility is that proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and the goodness of God. We know the, the story of Luke chapter 1. We know how Mary gets to this place. We, we read earlier how Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one. Mary then, then goes and visits Elizabeth, her cousin, who was old, past the age of childbearing, but God had miraculously caused her to become pregnant as well with, with, the, with the infant that would eventually be John the Baptist. And when Mary encounters Elizabeth, there's a conversation there, and it's in response to that that Mary gives these words, this song that we are looking at today. And as we look at it, we're going to major on three points. We're going to talk about the Lord's goodness to his people, the Lord's goodness to Mary, and then the Lord's goodness to all people. True humility is that proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and the goodness of God. Consider the Lord's goodness then, his goodness to his people. And to, and to consider this, I want to direct your attention to verse 50. Right in the middle of Mary's song. We're going we're gonna to go back and pick up those earlier verses in a few minutes. But first, look at verse 50. It's in the middle of the song. It's central in that sense. But I think this verse is also central in the sense that it conveys the main thought of the whole song. In verse 50, Mary says, His mercy, God's mercy, is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Mary is, I think, alluding here to one of the Psalms. Psalm 103, verse 17 says this, The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to children's children. The word that's translated mercy here in, in Luke 1 also translates the word that's used in Psalm 103.17 as steadfast love. It's, it's, it, the words are all connected to each other. It's in Hebrew, in the psalm, it's the word hesed. It's God's covenant love. God's love for His people. We're talking now about not just the general love that God has for all people, that He has for His creation. We're talking about the love that God has for His people, those with whom He is in covenant. And it is this love, this mercy that Mary says, as she quotes the psalmist, is for those who fear Him. For those who fear Him from generation to generation. Well, what does it mean to fear God? I mean, I think you'd agree we want to be those who experience the mercy of the Lord. We want to be those who experience the covenant love of God, but apparently we have to be those who fear Him to experience that. So, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Again, I think like humility, this is a word that we often misunderstand at first glance. We hear fear the Lord, and probably what goes through our mind is, you know, being scared of God. You should be scared of God. Be afraid. Be very afraid. 
think that's quite it. I don't think that's quite what the scripture means. And in witness of that, let me, let me read to you several verses that use that word fear and use it in different ways so that we can kind of get a sense of what the Bible means when it tells us to fear the Lord. Listen, in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12, we read, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You see there, the fear of the Lord is connected with serving and loving. Isn't that interesting? We don't usually put fear and love in the same category, but here they're together. Psalm 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Psalm 22.23, you who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. Stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. When you think of fear, does it usually make your heart leap for joy? Yeah, that's what the psalmist is saying. You who fear the Lord, glorify Him, worship Him, praise Him. Or think of these words from Isaiah, verse 8. He says, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, Him you should regard as holy. Let Him be your fear. Let Him be your dread. And He will become a sanctuary. He will become a sanctuary. He will become a safe place for you when you fear Him. And of course, we remember the proverb, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You see, all these verses, and, and we could, I mean, the fear of the Lord is talked about hundreds of times in Scripture. We could go on and on, but all of these places, I think we could argue that the word fear is used slightly differently. There's a different sense, a different nuance in all these different places. You can't just let, have one kind of definition of fear and slap it into every place where the word appears. Okay? You have to look at what it means in context. But, but I think we can see a pattern emerging nonetheless. What I want to suggest to you is that when we consider the fear of the Lord, what we should think of it meaning is reverence and awe and being overwhelmed with the goodness and the glory of God. I think that gets at what the scripture means when it talks about fearing the Lord. Being overwhelmed. A life-changing experience of being overwhelmed with the glory and the goodness of God. So, with that idea in mind, then let's reread verse 50. His mercy, his Love, his hasid, his covenant love, is for those who are overwhelmed with the glory and the goodness of God from generation to generation. God's normal way of dealing with his people is to demonstrate this goodness and mercy to them from generation to generation, wherever they are, whenever they are. This is how God works. This is his normal way of dealing with his people. He shows them mercy. He shows them grace. He lavishes His love on them. This is the evidence of God's goodness. If we would experience God's goodness, if we would experience God's mercy, as Mary talks about here, we have to realize that we cannot have that without also embracing this biblical kind of fear, this sense of reverence and awe, this sense of being overwhelmed by His goodness. You see, they go together. We can't experience His goodness and mercy until we're overwhelmed by His goodness and mercy. And when we experience His goodness and mercy, we will be overwhelmed by His goodness and mercy. You can't have one without the other. They go together. To expect to have God's goodness and His mercy and His love without also embracing this biblical kind of fear is absurd. And it's crass too, isn't it? Whenever we have relationships with people, we are meant to have relationships with the whole person, aren't we? We can't pick and choose which aspects of their personality we will take and leave. We expect children to act that way sometimes. We expect children to want their parents' uh, treats, the good things that their parents have to give, their affection and things, and to not want their instruction. That's normal for children. 
but it's normal, friends, for children. It's not acceptable for adults. We expect adults to grow out of that and realize that you take the good along with the bad, so to speak. Right? If you have a friend who wants only your good things and none of your bad things, they're not a good friend. So it is in our relationship with God. If we would have God's goodness and love and mercy, we must also embrace this fear. And when we embrace the fear, we realize this is a good thing too. Are you, brothers and sisters, are you overwhelmed with the goodness and the glory of God? True humility is a proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and the goodness of God. We see the Lord's goodness to his people. We see the Lord's goodness to Mary in particular. This is how she begins the, the song. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She exalts in the Lord. Notice what she's not saying here, what she's not exalting in. She's not exalting in. She's not rejoicing in the miracle of the virgin birth, of the virgin conception. When we think about Christmas and when we think about Gabriel appearing to Mary and, and, and all of the wonderful things associated with that, we often stand in amazement at this, at this miracle that, that, that Mary, though a virgin, conceived. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be amazed by that, but it's interesting, isn't it? That's not the focus of Mary's song. She's not rejoicing that she is the recipient of this great miracle. Rather, she's rejoicing Simply in God. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She exalts in the Lord, not the miracle of the virgin conception. She rejoices in God who saves her, not in herself as being worthy of recognition. Mary's joy is based in God, not her wonderful experiences. I think that's instructive for us, don't you? We often rejoice merely in our circumstances when they're good. And then the flip side of that is that when our circumstances are bad, we stop rejoicing. Or maybe, maybe you, like, like I, have, have wished that we were those who experienced miracles the way people in the Bible experience miracles. But what's interesting is when you read the stories of miracles in the Bible, like the miracle of the virgin birth, or any other miracles, miracles that Jesus performed or others in the scriptures, one of the things that you notice is that the people who are most affected by the miracles are less amazed by the miracle that they experience than they are by the God who performed the miracle. So friends, we don't need to long for miracles. We need to long for God. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Why? Look at the reason for Mary's blessedness in verses 48 and 49. He has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Her blessedness is based on her relationship with God, whom she calls the Mighty One, he who is mighty. She does not base her blessedness in her status as the mother of Messiah. She considers herself blessed because God has worked in her life. She's looking at what God has done in her. And that's leading her to rejoice. When I read this, I, I, I think about another encounter later on in Luke's Gospel. Do you remember the story where Jesus sends the disciples out to, to preach the good news and to, and, to, and to minister to the people, preach the Gospel of the Kingdom? And, and they go out and, they, and they, they perform miracles of their own, empowered by Jesus. They cast out demons and they come back to Jesus in Luke 10 and they're rejoicing. Because they saw God work in that powerful way. They saw God casting out demons through their ministry. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. Luke 10, 20, he says, Do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. You see, it's the same thing over and over again, isn't it? It's not the miracles that we're meant to focus on. It's our relationship with God. In that sense, we are the recipients of a great miracle ourselves, aren't we? God, through His Spirit, has reached into our dead hearts and made them alive. That's a miracle. We have relationship with God. We can rejoice in Him the way Mary does. We can say the same thing that Mary says. He has looked on my humble estate. 
We are those who are now blessed for all generations. The one who is mighty has done great things for each of us. And we can say, holy is his name. You see what's happening in Mary's song? You see what's happening as you reflect on this? Are you thinking about being humbled right now? No. You're thinking about God. That's humility. You see, that's what humility is. True humility is an estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and goodness of God. She praises God. Holy is His name. Her attention is fixated on God and His goodness. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, writes this about humility. He says, Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble. Probably, all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you had to say. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And a biggish step, too. At least, nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you're very conceited indeed. <laughs> Rick Warren, Rick Warren says, I don't usually quote Rick Warren, but, but, but I think it's in Purpose Driven Life. He, he says about humility that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. That's the point here. True humility is that proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and the goodness of God. As we think about Christmas and getting ready for the Christmas season and celebrations, what is our basis for joy and blessedness? Is it the same as Mary's? Or are we focused on, on the other aspects of Christmas? Allow yourself to be overwhelmed by God's goodness because His goodness is not just for Mary, it's for all people. Consider the Lord's treatment of all people. Look at verses 51 and 52. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This is how God treats the proud. He scatters them. He disperses them. It speaks of God's punishment uh, of, of those who are wicked. It also is a reminder of how God punished even his own people. He punished Israel by sending them into exile. And in Mary's day, as she says these words, Israel was still being punished by being under the heel of Roman emperors. This is how he treats the proud. He brings down rulers from their thrones. You see, the, the point is, as we look at the world, we see the powerful. We see people in power who we wish weren't in power. You can see that's all around the world, tyrants and dictators. You see God's people being oppressed. But God says, that's not the end of the story. The proud will be brought down. Rulers will be held to account. So look, if you are not happy with the leadership that you see in our country, take heart. God brings down rulers. If you are happy with the leadership you see in our country, be warned. God brings down rulers. He scatters the proud. He brings down the mighty from their thrones because he is the true king. The Lord treats the proud this way. He treats the humble in a different way. He exalts the humble. He feeds the hungry. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent away empty. The rich become destitute. The hungry become sated. The humble are exalted. This is what God delights to do in the world. This is the result of the coming of the kingdom of God. And specifically, we see the Lord's fulfillment of his promises to Israel. Verses 54 and 55. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Now, understand what Mary is saying in these last couple of verses. As Mary considers what God has promised to do through her, 
As Mary considers the fact that she will be the mother of the true king of Israel. She will be the mother of the Messiah. She will be the mother of the one who would save his people from their sins. When Mary considers this, she sees in that the fulfillment of all of God's promises to his people. From Abraham on down the line. As he spoke to our fathers, Abraham and his offspring forever. Bob did, uh, did some of this work last week when he reminded us of God's promises, of, of God's working throughout redemptive history in bringing salvation to his people. But remember some of those promises. Remember what God said to Abraham, that he would be a blessing to all peoples. Remember what he said to David, that he would have a king who would sit on his throne forever. Remember all these promises. Remember all of the prophecies throughout Scripture. Mary looks at all of those and says, this is the fulfillment of them. What's happening in Mary's body is the fulfillment of God's covenant relationship with his people down through history. What that means for us, brothers and sisters, is that as we consider Christmas, as we consider the event that we celebrate at Christmas, what we are thinking about is not just a sweet baby in a manger. What we are, what we are celebrating is not just a, a miraculous event that happened 2,000 years ago. What we are celebrating is the fulfillment of God's promises. What we are celebrating is that the kingdom has finally come. That the king came. The king was born. Jesus, the Redeemer, the promised one, the Messiah. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what Advent is about. And you know why we celebrate Advent, don't you? Advent is, at its core, not celebration, it's waiting. You realize that? Advent is about waiting. We spend four Sundays preparing ourselves, and it's all leading up to Christmas. And we're training ourselves to look forward to, to wait for the real celebration. But even Christmas isn't the real celebration, is it? Even Christmas is just one day where we remind ourselves what happened. But all of life becomes a season of Advent then. Because all of our life we are waiting. We're waiting. We're looking forward. We're preparing ourselves for the second coming. For the final coming. The return of Jesus the King. And that's when the real celebration will begin. Advent, then, is a, is a training season for us, isn't it? It's how we remind ourselves of what's really important and how we prepare ourselves to wait for it. It's being overwhelmed by the goodness of God in this way. True humility is that proper estimation of self that results from being overwhelmed by the glory and the goodness of God. Are we willing to humble ourselves before God? Are we able to repent and trust in the Messiah? Are we humble enough to rejoice in Him and His holiness rather than in ourselves? As we continue to, to celebrate Advent, as we prepare ourselves to celebrate Christmas, that's what I want to ask you to consider. Don't try to be humble. Just think about God. Focus on God. Let yourselves be overwhelmed by God. Take a moment in silent thought and reflection. Ask God to overwhelm you with his goodness and his glory and rest in him.